we could approach this about a thousand different ways. I'm just telling you, even though there's just two little verses, I'm just going to get comfortable. It's, uh, this is, uh, all, all scriptures is magnificent. This is pretty deep, though, and you could take it so uh, deep. I used to just, just kind of study the, the tabernacle because, you know, I knew that the Bible was small. I mean, a lot of people look at it like it's large because you're used to small books and you're used to, especially today, you know, we just get sound bites, so God forbid you got to read a book. But, um, you know, when I look at the religious books of, of, of the Bhagavad Gita's and, and the I Ching's and the other religions, you know, there's volumes and volumes. Even the Talmud is 63 tractates, it's 6,200 pages. So when I look at the Bible, I think it's incredibly small. And when I look at the red letters, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. You know, that's the way I feel. So it's not like uh, voluminous by, by no means. So when I see God spending 16 chapters on a subject in a book like Exodus, I'm thinking it's probably important, you know, especially when we have folks out there making a theology out of one obscure verse in a book of Romans and then just glossing over 16 chapters of the Bible. So it's, it's quite important, and we'll try to, I'll skin this cat you know, the way I think the Lord told me to, but you're, by all means, that's the, that's the beauty of the Word of God. It's like a diamond. You know, it depends on what angle you look at it. You know, and you get to see another facet. So, you know, have at it. Have fun with the Word of God. Have fun with the Spirit of God. You know, all you need to be a theologian, to be honest with you, is a good Bible, a good concordance, and a good Holy Spirit. And you have access to all three of those. Um, let's look at the first verse. Exodus 25, 8. You got that? Okay. Here's the, the, the beginning where they've just taken up a contribution, and the Lord says, they are to make me. Okay, God's speaking. He's saying, make me, not you. Make me a sanctuary so that I may live among them. Now, um, look at these two words, just live among, and you'll, you'll get a lot out of it. If we just... I'm, I'm trying, um, I guess what I'm trying to do is teach you how to read the Word of God and how to study the Word of God because it seems like with all, with all the sermons that are out there, nobody's teaching anybody how to read and study and understand the Word of God because if you understand the Word of God, you'll understand the heart of God and you'll understand God. Make sense? You, you can depend on the Word of God, but you can't just depend on dreams. Dreams don't always come from God. Sometimes they come from subconscious thoughts, and sometimes they come from the enemy. So let's look at this word live. God says, I want to live among you, shochan. It means to settle down, to reside, and to live with. Are you catching this? Do you see what the Almighty is saying? I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but in Exodus 19, God married Israel. A wedding took place. Yeah, you had a groom who was who? God. You had a bride who was who? You even had a best man. Who was that? Yes. He presented the bride to the groom. You had a chuppah because they were forming a new relationship. What was the chuppah? The cloud cover. You had a band. Who was the band? Thunder and lightning. And you had a ketubah, a wedding contract. What was that? Yeah. You even had a ring. Exodus 31 said, I'm going to give you a sign that I'm married to you. And what was the sign? Shabbat. Yeah, wow. We can go on. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just saying I, I can go on and on about that. But I think you get the message. So now he's like married and he goes, you know what? What does a married couple need? They need a place to live. I very highly disagree when somebody has their own place and they get married and they move into that place. I say, get a new place. Start fresh. That's just my opinion. But, you know, sometimes it's budget and issues. I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm just telling you it's best to, to leave and leave and cleave yes. and start something new. Just my opinion. Okay, so this is what God's saying. Let's, let's build something new. Let's build that. Isn't this, in, do you find this intimate? That God wants to live with Israel? He wants to settle down. You know, when a guy says, you know, I think it's time to settle down. We've been dating for three, four years, been running around. I want to settle down. I want to just focus on you. 
and I want to have a family and a life with you. Can you imagine? The creator saying, I want to settle down. That's what he's saying. And then he says, I want to live among. Look at this word. If this isn't beautiful, tavech, in the mist. I don't want to live near you. See, there's a lot of people. I mean, I've met, see, in New York, you, you, there's, there's just a smidgen of Christians. By the way, the latest statistic, according to the pulpit series, is 70% of America say they're Christian. And 10% admit of the 70, which means 7%. 10% of 70. 10% admit they're not biblical Christians, which means they're not Christians, sweet pea. You're not. No more than if you hang out in your garage, you're going to be a car. It doesn't work that way. You have to be born again. There are people, denominations, that believe that born again is a denomination. When you say born again Christian, that's redundant. You're saying I'm a Christian Christian. It's silly. You're either born again or you're not. You're either a saint or you ain't. You follow? And that's true. You have to be born again. There's no other way around it. And this isn't my opinion, it's Yeshua's opinion. So here he is saying that he wants to live among. That means in the middle. He doesn't want to be part of your life. He doesn't want like Wednesday night I bowl, Thursday night I get together with the guys and we do a little shooting, and Sunday morning I get together with God. When they built the tabernacle, where was it? In the center. And for you that are going with me to Israel, I'm going to take you to Capernaum, which is the only place that we really know exists. We don't know about the temple on the mount. We don't know where that is. They're traditional sites, and I'm not that interested. But I am interested in Kephanachum, the village of comfort, where he ministered and lived. And guess what? How many temples are there? Hmm. That forces you to get along, and if you don't, you're out. You can't build another church like we do here so flagrantly. We can't run and go to another church to stick it to our first church. So there was one temple. And where was the temple? In the center of town. In the center of town, the synagogue. The center of Capernaum. Why? Because God wants to be your center. He doesn't want to be near you. He doesn't want to be around you. He doesn't want you to call on him when you're in trouble. He wants to be right in the center of you. And what's the center of you? Your heart. Not the organ not the organ, but the center of who you are, the very essence of who you are, your soul, if you will, your mind, your decision maker, the seat of your emotions. He wants to be right. He wants to sit on the seat of your emotions. And he wants to steer your life. But he wants to commune. He wants to commune. He wants relationship. It was his idea, not ours. And we know we're relational because when we don't have relationships, we die. Today, nobody wants relationships because we've been so burnt by relationships, we don't want them. But they have done studies, scientific studies on women's brain that shows when a woman doesn't get together with other women, the stress level is like smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Now, hear me. Whose idea was this? Science? No. There's not a doctor in the world that comes up with anything. It all comes from God, pal. There was something called the Court of Women 3,400 years ago. What do you think that was for? God wants to relate to you, not just in a Bible study, not just Sunday morning, all the time. Why do you think it says pray all the time? It doesn't mean to sit there and intercede. Nobody can do that. It means to commune, connect, hang out, just be. And he knows we're crazy, so he says, you know what, I'll just set aside one day. Can you handle that? Can you give me that? But you can't even give that. you got to run to Walmart, do your chores, run here, run there. Run, 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 run. But we can sit every night for three hours on the couch and watch TV. I'm just saying you're missing out. The first time I ever went to a church... The pastor of this church way back asked me if I'd give my testimony. Christmas Eve. I've never been to a church. I don't know from church. So I started going, and it was a little, I told you about the pastor. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful man. Loving, loving, loving people. Small, nothing, little Episcopal church. But on Christmas Eve, the place was packed. And it was standing room. And I leaned into Bernard, and I go, what's going on? I thought there'd just be 30 people here back in 1992, 25 years ago. And she said, Greg, 
um, there are people who just go to church twice a year. And I go, no, that can't, you're kidding, right? <laughs> and she goes, no. I says, I was so naive. I go, they're missing out on so much good stuff. What, what would possess them to go twice a year? But there's many that go every week and still no connection. You know, you could spend your whole life teaching your kids about God and not even connect yourself. You could spend your whole life going to church. You could spend your whole life reading the Bible and still not connect with God. Amazing, huh? Only the enemy could pull that off to make you think you're okay. The next verse, Exodus 25, 9, he says, you ought to make, so he's saying, um, let's build a house so that I can hang out. And did he hang out in that house? Oh, yeah. Was he always in that house? He never leaves nor forsakes. He was in the Holy of Holies always. The cloud was always there. And the only time it moved was when he wanted to move to another spot. But he said, you know, let's move together. He never left because God doesn't leave nor forsake. But then he says, look, you ought to make it according to everything I show you. The design of the tabernacle, okay, which tabernacle basically means presence, and the design of its furnishings. This is how you ought to make it. And then the next verse, which Jason read, 26.1, he gives details. Detailed even down to how many fasteners are on each curtain. Do you think God's trying to send a message? Look at this word, design. It's tabneath, and it's a pattern or a model, a, 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 a template, basically. He's being very clear, very clear and very concise about following his instructions to a T. He's saying no deviation. Basically, he's saying don't add to the instructions and don't take away. Sound familiar? He says it about his ways, and then he repeats it in Revelation about the book of Revelation, specifically about end times. Don't add to it, don't take away. And then at the end of chapter 25, this is the last verse, look at this, verse 40. See to it, he reiterates, see to it that you make them according to the design being shown you on the mountain. Again, God reiterates, he repeats himself, and he says there's no room for human improvisation. Don't ad lib. And so if, if, if we should be so careful with the size of the fasteners and the number of fasteners on the curtain, how careful should we be with spiritual matters and building up the spiritual tabernacle, which is the people of God? And yet you have clowns in the pulpits today entertaining the goats instead of shepherds feeding the sheep. And that wasn't my quote. That's Spurgeon 160 years ago, pal. So think of how many more clowns have entered into the community of God today. And the goats want to be entertained. Entertain me. Build a beautiful home. Get a bunch of water slides for my kids. There's people spending millions of dollars on their children's center. Millions. It's nicer than any cruise ship I've seen. What do you think they're doing? They're entertaining the kids so that on the ride home from church, mommy and daddy who goes for the first time says, how was it? And the kid says, it was awesome, which they shouldn't even be using that word. Plus, it's reserved for the name of God and the reputation of God according to Psalm 111. And then the parents are like, this is great. And they've got donuts. And then they go off to college, and within months... They don't even know if God exists, and they're, you know, being tempted by having a homosexual relationship, and they're getting high, and where's God? And they go to mom and dad, I don't, I don't even think God exists. And you're like, you went to church every Sunday. You, 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 went to, you went to every youth group, every youth camp. What happened? What happened is, first of all, you weren't living it at home. It wasn't legit, possibly. And secondarily, Yeshua didn't say, come to church. He said, come to me. Not a clergyman, not a church, not the waters of baptism. He said, moi. Look, God is trying to communicate to us that when the devil 
or your foes or your family or your quote-unquote friends say, did God really say? You say, you better believe he did. Don't let them twist it. Don't. I don't care how liberal and crazy society gets. I could care less. The conference I'm going to speak at, I'm leaving here right afterward, is called Culture and Christianity. They called me a, a year, a, 13 months ago. The Baptist Convention called and said, would you come and speak? What do you, they said, what are you doing March 2017? I said, hopefully breathing. That's 13 months from now. <laughs> what do you guys do? Do you schedule everything out? We could have a conference next week. We just started about this book signing in three days. It's like, how much time do you need? But the whole idea is they, they invited some speakers who would speak about culture and Christianity. How do you conduct yourself as a believer, as a Christian, in a post-Christian society? By the way, America is now post-Christian. I don't know if you know that. Europe is anti-Christian. America is post-Christian. My take on it is, uh, what's the difference if it's post-Christian, anti-Christian, or pro-Christian? I'm a disciple. I could care less. You follow? Okay. The, the New Testament reading was from the book of Hebrews, which Hebrews, he's speaking to Messianic Jews. Right? If you... Romans... He's speaking to Gentile. It, you, the letters, they're written to people. Somebody wrote it. There was an audience that he wrote to. Yes, we can use it for teaching purposes, but they're letters. They're epistles. It's not the gospel. It's epistles, letters. And so he's speaking, and basically what you find in the book of Hebrews, the synopsis, if you will, is don't go back to the sacrificial system. It's done. He didn't say the law is nailed. I mean... Is adultery okay now? I never got that memo. I know some people have. Is it okay to lie and steal and covet? Is, is it okay to not take care of the poor little new orphan? Is it okay to just overlook the gray-headed? Is this something, is something I miss? No, of course not. It would be silly to even say that. I don't understand. Sometimes I used to just go to churches and they'd, I'd hear the, the preacher say, he's nailed the law to the cross. And then outside in the parking lot, it said the Ten Commandments, read him, obey him. And I'm like, is this guy a spiritual schizophrenic? I'm confused. <laughs> guy, listen to me. He did not nail the law to the cross. He nailed your lawlessness. He didn't come to die for the law. The law is holy, just, and good, Romans 7, 12, 7, 14. But we are carnal. We're the problem. He came to die for sin, not for the law. And if you're truly born again, you'd have the laws on your heart. You would be more lawful than more lawless. See, they start you out messed up. This is what they say to you. Look, nobody can do it. You're going to fail. So don't bother. Wow, that's crazy. You should have never said that. You never said that. You imagine saying to your kid, hey, I know you're going to be playing this football game, but just know this. You're not that good. Your team's not that good. The other team is far superior. There's no way you can win, but go out there. Do your best. <laughs> See, they start with this greasy grace. They start you out that, hey, you can't do it, so don't bother. But don't worry. You've got grace. The truth is history. People call that greasy grace. I call that sloppy agape. You're taking abuse. You're abusing God's love. Yeah. Now, for the people that are all truth and no grace, they're destructive. They just destroy people. Every time people just mess up a little bit, they're all over them. Look, you're not a believer. Listen, sweetheart, you're not Torah observant, okay? You're not Torah observant. You're trying to be, but you're not. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try and use the power, the second grace. You know what the second grace is? The Spirit of God. It's a power to do what? What is it there for? What does it come into your life for? Just you can walk around and with your feathers say, look, I'm, I'm full of it. You sure are. <laughs> it's a power 
from on high. He said, wait to receive the power. For what? So you'd be my witnesses. How do we witness? The greatest witness is a holy, a holy lifestyle. Yes, of course, yes. We'll fall short. But don't start out like that and end like that. Well, we'll fall short, so why bother? Wow. Imagine if you took that attitude in life. Where would you be? Watching Dr. Phil at 10 o'clock and collecting a check. That's where you'd be, where a lot of people are. Okay, so look at Hebrews 8, 5. It says, but, they, but what they are serving is only a copy and a shadow, meaning the tabernacle they built. It's a type and shadow of what? The heavenly original. There's some original. Is it, is it a physical temple up there? Probably not. Probably not. But there's some, something spiritual about a way to approach God. And the physical manifestation of that was supposed to express the spiritual aspect of how to approach God. It says, for when Moshe was about to erect the tent, the tabernacle, the tent means the holy of holies and the holy place. That's really the, the tabernacle. It's not really the outer courtyard. See to it that you make it, ev- that you make everything according to the pattern. He's repeating what we just read in Exodus 25, and that's obviously why we chose it. Why I didn't choose it. I didn't choose it. Somebody chose it. So they're building on earth a replica of the heavenly sanctuary. Look at these words, copy and shadow, for a minute. Very simply, a representation. A representation. Not the exact, but a representation. And shadow, of course, means an image. Why are these in Greek? Because the New Testament was written in Greek, so we've got to look up the words in the Greek. An image, if you will. So the layout of the tabernacle, which is, which is close to what we have here. We have an outer courtyard, and then we have the table of showbread, and we have the menorah, and we have the Ark of the Covenant. We're missing the brazen altar and the brazen laver, thank God, because we don't need those anymore. But they were here, and they were in a row. It really forms a cross, but I don't want to get into that because that's just not exactly the most important thing. But you walk right into the tabernacle, and you have the brazen altar, then the brazen laver, then the table of showbread, the menorah, then beyond, you have the altar of incense, and then the Ark of the Covenant, which housed the Spirit of God. That layout depicted the way in which God's covenant people, us, could approach him in worship. There's steps to be taken. You know, I love that we put speed bumps because it slows you down. Not slow you down so much to prevent an accident, which we did it for, but that's not why God did it. God did it so you'd slow down and understand where you're going and who you're going before. You should take your time. You know what the most important thing about prayer is, even though a two-year-old can wield it, and they've written books and books on the subject? You know what my opinion is? The most important thing about prayer is that you know before whom you stand while you pray. So I like that you have to take your time a little bit and think about why are you coming? Who are you going before? What do you want to express? And if you'll notice, the Sermon on the Mount lines up beautifully with the tabernacle. You've got to come through the door. That's humility. You've got to go to the brazen altar. That's contrition and brokenness. You've got to go to the labor. That's submission. Meek. And then it says those who thirst and hunger. Thirst. Spirit of God. Hunger. The Word of God. Those that are merciful. Incense. The prayer's intercession. Incense. Mercy. Loving kindness. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who broke a peace, not those who have peace. Blessed are those pure in heart that don't have mixed, emo- mixed ideologies, if you will. Their heart is pure before the Lord. They're not there to make a name for themselves. You know, you have no idea how many hours I spend in prayer just about going to this Tennessee thing. It's almost crazy. Like, why? Why do you have to spend so many hours? Because my prayer is, Father, please let it not be about what I'm going to share. Because I know that's part of it. Can you take it away? Lord, be the ventriloquist. I'll be the dummy. Please. 
because the, the minute I get concerned about what I'm going to bring, and if I'm concerned about that the people will, will enjoy it or like it, I've lost. Now, can I get rid of myself totally? It's not easy. But that's what I'm shooting for before I go there and while I'm there. That's, that's the, what I'm shooting for. And the ends with blessed are those who are persecuted. Not persecuted for doing wrong. I go to prisons and some guys go, we're being persecuted. I said, no, you broke the law. You're not being persecuted. Okay? And you're getting an education and you're getting dental. You know what it costs to house a prisoner in the state of California, 2016 to 2017? $71,000. When I first got into ministry, I was making $100 a week. Then I jumped up to 1,000. Of course, still had to, 1,000 a month, still had to work a second job, which I did for years and years and years. 71 grand. Medical care? What's their deductible? Mine's 5,000, I'm paying 2,500 a month. I'm just throwing that out there. Something to think about. I mean, your education isn't free. We homeschool, but we pay school taxes, so I'm paying for your kid to go to school. It's not free. It costs. It's a sacrifice. Take advantage of it. Now, the main thing I want to tell you before we split is that this physical tabernacle is representative of a greater spiritual reality. And the tabernacle teaches us spiritual lessons regarding the person and the work of the Messiah. Let me show you what I mean, and I'm just going to use a little bit of scripture. Look at Exodus 25. The first thing they're told to do is they are to make an ark of acacia wood, three, and a, three quarters feet long, two and a quarter feet wide. Look at how specific. And two and a quarter feet high. You are to overlay it with pure gold, overlay it both inside and outside, so overlay it and underlay it, and put a molding, a crown, if you will, of gold around the top of it. Why did he speak about the ark first? Because it's going to house the word of God. And it's going to be there that they're going to offer blood once a year to atone for the sins of Israel. So it's the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle. Look at John 1.1 1, 1 in verse 14. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became a human being and lived with us. And we saw his Shekhinah, his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and full of truth. Now, here you have the Word of God in this, in this ark, if you will, because it, it looks like a coffin, actually. And another word for ark in the Hebrew, our own, is coffin. And it says that Yeshua was the Word, and he took on flesh and tabernacled, so he was the ark of God. And inside his ark was the word. If you opened up his chest, you'd see the Torah. He was the word of God with human form. Now, it says that the ark was supposed to be made of wood. Do you know what wood symbolizes in the Bible? Wood, you ha when you look up symbols in the Bible, you can't see it in one verse. You have to see it all the way through, like something like the olive tree. Wood represents man. Do you know what gold represents? deity. It was wood surrounded, overlaid by gold. Who was Yeshua? Man. So, and it wasn't just overlaid, it was underlaid. So over and under. And it wore a crown. Now, acacia wood. Do you know what acacia wood is? It's wood found in the desert. It's wood known as incorruptible wood. In Israel, they know it as incorruptible wood. It's harder than stone. It can't be defective. Because it's so hardy in the desert that it, you, you can hit it with a hammer, you won't break it. A sledgehammer, you won't break it. What do we know about this man, Yeshua? Yes, he was man, but he was incorruptible wood. He never sinned. No? Okay, that one didn't do it for you. Let's try the mercy seat. Wake up, sleeper before it's too late. 
Let's look at the mercy seat. Kaporeth is a place of atonement. Now, the mercy seat was on top of the ark. And you had two angels with their wings attached. And the mercy seat was made of gold. And the high priest would sprinkle blood how many times? Seven times on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. On the day of atonement, you have to go to the place of atonement. Seven speaks of spiritual perfection. I don't want to get into gematria, but every word in Hebrew has a numerical equivalent, and every number has a word associated with it. Seven is spiritual perfection. So we can only be perfected by the blood. And the cherubim would look for that blood every year. When Yeshua was laid in the tomb, and I'll take you there, it looked like an, they made the tombs inside had an ark that they'd lay on top. And when they went to see him, was there not an angel on one side and an angel on the other side? Did not his blood spill? Yeshua is the mercy seat of God. He is the seat of our mercy. He is the seat of tender loving kindness. He came willingly and gave his life for us. And his blood was more than enough. Seven times. They put nails through his hands. Two spikes. That's two. Through his ankles. That's four. A crown of thorns. Five, flogging, six, the spear, seven. Perfect. Look at the root word for mercy seat. Kafar, to cover, to purge, to reconcile. He's got us covered. You're covered. You're clothed in his righteousness, not anything you do. Should you do righteous works? Yes. Should you thirst and hunger? Yes. Should you build hospitals for the underprivileged? Yes. Should you give? Yes. 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 But know this, in your best day, you still need to be covered. When you go before God, he's going to look to see the blood on the, on the doorpost and lintel of your heart. And if it ain't there, You're clothed, it says in Isaiah, in the righteousness of Messiah. <laughs> Romans, look what it says in 325. God put Yeshua forward as our kapora. Yeah. He's saying that to the Gentiles. He's our kippur. For sin through his faithfulness in respect to his bloody, disgusting, sacrificial death. Let's move on to the table of showbread. Before you put up that scripture, hold on one second, sweet pea. Thank you. The table of showbread is known as the bread of presence. Yes. It's not about the table. It's about the bread. The bread of presence. Presence pornim, the face of God. The face of God. Look at what Yeshua says in John 6.35. I'm the bread. <laughs> I'm the bread of God's presence. When you see me, you're seeing the face of God. And he's saying, yes, you could feed all day long, and we love to eat. It's obvious. But he's saying, feed off me. God is sending the bread of his presence to satisfy spiritual hunger. Lechem is bread. It just means bread. Beth lechem is house of bread. But there's a root word in the Hebrew, lacham, and it means to fight and wage war. If you're going to fight the power, you need the power to fight. You have to feed off Yeshua, feed off the word, energized by the spirit in order to combat the enemy. So we, we feed off the word, but we need the juice. There comes the menorah, the lampstand. It would light the way. It was angled, and it would light the way into God's presence. It shows you the way into God's presence. Look at John 8, 12. Yeshua says, I'm the light of the world. He's saying the world is in darkness. It is from sin. It's simple. It might not be a pretty word. I don't know what word you like, but that's what it is, lawlessness. It's a lawless society. Rebellious, even in the body of Messiah. So much rebellion. The world is in darkness from sin, and we desperately need the Spirit to guide us along the way of life. Once born again, we have access to this guidance, and we have a bright hope beyond this life and beyond the grave. Next is the brazen altar. Look at Hebrews 10, 8 through 10. It says, in saying first, you neither will nor were pleased with animal sacrifices, meal offerings, burnt offerings, 
Why? Why? Because if we had animal sacrifices today, you know what you would do? You'd go to the ASPCA and grab some mangy mutt and throw them on the altar. Just like when you give your stuff away to Goodwill, do you give your best? Go buy a new suit. Well, don't give it to Goodwill. They're thieves. Give it to Rescue Mission. But why are you giving them your junk? You mean to tell me it's so worn out you figure, ah, they're just bums, right? They're just homeless. Give them a worn out suit. Give them a new suit. What? What? It's good for you, but not for them. See, back in the day, the animals, like for Adam, they were his kids. Can you imagine if you sinned and somebody brought the skin of your kid to you? That's what it was like for Adam. Oh, wouldn't it be great if you had a family pet? You know, the kids love the dog. They love the dog, right? Some people love their animals more than people. That's kind of demented, but anyway, they love the dog. Wouldn't it be nice if you started to take the dog and you brought your little son and you brought it to the altar and slit its throat and the kid screamed and said, Daddy, why do you have to do that? Daddy sinned. There's a huge price, son. It wreaks havoc. It's like a spiritual hurricane. Violently wreaks havoc in people's lives. You know how many people are mentally ill because of sin? Because they were abused or taken advantage of? Sexual sin, yes. and they can't cope no matter what pill they take. You understand what we perpetrate? There's got to be a cost, and you'll never know the value of the cross until you put a cost on sin. So, what cost do we put on it? I don't know. What do we put on a lie? What do we put on stealing? Well, it's coming to me. The government cheats me, so I'll cheat them. What price tag do we put on rape or incest? Tell me. I don't know. What do I know? See, God was sick of this stuff because it wasn't, it wasn't coming from the heart anymore. They were just bringing junk to the Lord, and it became a stench. But he says, it is in connection with this will that we have been separated for God and made holy once and for all through the offering of Yeshua. You can't compare that. God's only begotten to a bunch of goats and bulls. No offense to goats and bulls. But it is what it is. The brazen altar is made of what? It's not a trick question. Brass. Bronze. Brazen. Brass is any metal alloy that consists of copper and zinc. What do we know about zinc? Zinc is used to make galvanized iron. What do we know about copper? It's, it's very malleable what's God saying about his judgment he's saying that it's strong like iron but it's bendable the brazen altar was like a mirror back in the day so when you went before the brazen altar with your animal guess whose face you saw in the altar you had to put the animal on top you climbed upstairs put on top. the animal shouldn't be taking the hit we should be what did the animal do the poor animal God was trying to show us, stop. But he's saying, my judgment, like iron. But the copper in there, it's bendable. If you come to me my way through Yeshua, it's my way. God says, forget about Frank Sinatra. He's gone, right? What do we know about brass? Zinc and copper. What's zinc? A bluish white metal. What's copper? Reddish brown. Bluish white, like the tabernacle, the curtain before the Holy of Holies. Blue represents the heavens. Yeshua, Son of God, white, perfect man, the Son of Man. Red, atonement, the blood price, the bullock. And what do you get when you mix those colors together? Purple. The king of kings comes to be slaughtered for you and I so that we can have a relationship with God here and now that sin wouldn't have dominion over our soul. Listen to me. It's so much more than eternity. I started sinning at a very young age. And I ran with a very bad pact. 
And I knew when I started sinning horribly, it was wrong and it got me sick. But I didn't know what to do because I wanted to hang with this pack. You follow? And I'm not blaming the pack. I take full responsibility. So what I did was I just kept sinning till it didn't bother me that much. Do you understand what I'm saying? We do it too in the body of Messiah. We've been doing it wrong for so long that it's okay. And so I kept doing it till I was like, uh-uh, I'm in control of this. I'm not that bad. And I started comparing myself to Jack the Ripper and, and people like that, and I wasn't so bad. And then my innocence was robbed, and I plotted sin on my bed. But when I got born again, I was plotting righteousness on my bed. It was a total change. Sin made me sick. If I felt like I lied to somebody, it made me sick. I would go to them and say, you know, I'm so sorry. I told you something that wasn't true. It should make you sick to your stomach. And it was a massive change. A massive change. God's judgment is strong, but it's pliable. Look at the altar of incense. Ephesians tells us, Yeshua was a, a pleasing fragrance. It was sweet-smelling. Metaphorically, a thing that was pleasing to God. Why? Why? Mission accomplished. Who could pull that off? Guys, he was fully man. Fully man. He wasn't a superhero like you watch the movies from Marvel. He was a man. When a pretty woman walked by, he saw her. When he was hungry, he was hungry. When he was tired, he was tired. When he was thirsty, he was thirsty. The cross was killing him. There wasn't a, when he was in pain, he was in pain. But he was tempted just like us in every way, but didn't fall prey to that temptation. How did he pull that off? Yes, he received the Spirit without measure, but we have access to the Spirit without measure if we so desire. It's a superman, legitimately. And it was mission accomplished. He came with one mission. He told them three times, Matthew 16, 18, and 20, respectively, I have to go to Jerusalem. I have to. Guys, you don't understand. That's why I came. And I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and the Torah teachers. Then they're going to hand me over to the Gentiles so the Gentiles could mock me, jeer me. How did the Jews get blamed for it? I'll never know. But leave it to Satan to pull that one off. Mock me, jeer me, execute me, which they did. Study Pontius Pilate's life. The Bible depicts him in that one sentence. That's all you know. I wash my hands. He was so evil, it was deplorable. They don't make him evil like that. But mission accomplished. Look at the next verse of Scripture. After Yeshua had taken the wine, he said, mission accomplished. It's finished. Nothing has to be added. I'm done. I did it. I'm done. I came to seek and save the lost. Mission accomplished. And now I'm gone. Which brings us to the last piece. The brazen laver. It says in Hebrews 10, it says, Now every Kohen, that's the high priest. That's the Kohen Hagadol, not the Levites. They were a separate sect of priests. These were the ones that can offer the blood of atonement once a year. Every Kohen stands every day doing his service, offering over and over and over and over and over the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Can the sacrifices take away sins? No, they could just cover them, but the guilt remains. Come on. How many of you born again? How much guilt is in the house? And the problem with guilt is when you can't forgive yourself, this is, this is the demented thing. This is how Satan works. Then you can't forgive anybody else. Because you're like, if I can't forgive myself, they don't deserve forgiveness, and what do we have? bunch of pseudo-believers running around not forgiving anybody. And, and, and we don't look like Yeshua, and therefore the world doesn't know. Because that's the essence of our faith. We forgive because we've been forgiven, but since we can't forgive ourselves, sweetness, we can't forgive anybody else. But we'll keep memorizing Scripture. I can do all things. You can't even forgive. What do you mean you can do all things? 
can't take away sins. It can't. It can't remove them. But this one, after he had offered, who's this one? This is what they're talking to Jewish people. And they're trying to prevent them from going back to the sacrificial system because the temple wasn't destroyed till 70. But this one, after he had offered for all time one single sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. This is the laver, guys. The laver was not used by people. It was used by the priest. And he went after he provided the sacrifice into the laver to wash his hands, symbolically to wash away the guilt of sin for the people. But all the hand washing in the world is going to wash away your guilt. But the cross was supposed to. There's no chair inside the Holy of Holies. Why is there no chair inside the Holy of Holies? The priest couldn't sit down. He had to come back next year and do it. And next year and do it. Never sit down. Never rest. When you shoe off the sacrifice, what did he do? That's the contrast between the high priest and the great high priest. Let me show you. Last verse, and then we're done. Mark 16, 19. So then after he had spoken to them, the Lord Yeshua was taken up into heaven and sat. See that? Now, that's metaphorical, to be honest with you. It means a place of honor. Did he actually sit? Is there a chair? Is God sitting on a chair? God's spirit. How do you just put spirit on a chair? It's okay. It's a mystery. It's supposed to be. I don't want to worship. I gave my life to the Lord. I'm not going to give my life to something I got figured out. I walk by faith. There was a saying etched in a concentration camp in Cologne, Germany, by a Jew in the concentration camp. His whole family was killed. Lice, 80 pounds, starving, dying, Watched his family murdered heinously. And he scratches on the concentration camp, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I feel it not. And I believe in God even when he's silent. How could an unsaved Jew in a concentration camp believe that? And you and I with all we have not. So, so that song about the thing. So let me just end with this. Remember I was telling you a couple of weeks ago, or last week, I don't remember, how I used to get visions all the time and visions all the time, and now because things are so busy and everything, I don't have almost time for that. So maybe God was merciful. So I got on my bike um, on, uh, on Tuesday. I was supposed to go see a doctor for a stress test, and I couldn't, I couldn't make the time, so I decided to do my own. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, not the smartest thing, because Bernadette said, well, what if you keel over when you're going up the hill as hard as you can? I go, well, then, obviously, I had a problem. <laughs> um, so I, I went out, and all of a sudden, I'm about two miles in. I passed by uh, this church, and I was just thinking about the goodness of God, and all of a sudden, I, I see uh, this vision, and I get taken up, um, and the Lord is uh, in the midst of all his praise and worship. The four living creatures are there, and the 24 elders are there, and they're putting their crowns, and picking up, putting their crowns, and they're singing, they're singing, and, and the Lord seems very austere, like he loves it, but something's missing. Just something's missing. And all of a sudden, Yeshua starts to ascend towards him, and he comes to his right side, and um, all of a sudden, the Lord, even though he's focusing on the worship, you know, he, he realizes, and he takes notice, and he starts smiling. Like, he's happy now. You know, his kid's home. And he looks so happy. And um, he didn't want to interrupt the worship, really. But I heard him say, um, you did it, kid. I'm so proud of you. And then he said, they nailed you, but you nailed it. And... Uh, Man, I was so caught up in, in the moment that I had to, you know, just stop the bike. I couldn't keep riding, you know. I mean, what he did, I just don't understand. I'm just a, a Jew from New York. I wasn't raised in this stuff like you guys. How does one not grab onto this? I ask my wife all the time, what, what is it? 
Are they afraid it's not true? Well, you know, if you really repent before the Lord, you'll know if it's true or not. And if it isn't, then bag it. But I'm, I'm here to tell you today that I stand before you by the grace and mercy of God. It is so uncomfortable for me to present you a book. It's so uncomfortable for me. You know, because it's like, you know, a book comes out and, you, you know, the only red carpet I'll ever walk is a carpet stained by Yeshua's blood. Amen. And it's so hard for me, you know. I'm going to this conference and, and to speak and, and people are excited and I just don't, I know me, so I don't see it that way. I'm like, how did this happen? Why is anybody listening to me? Nobody would ever listen to me. I, I wouldn't even listen to me. And I couldn't read a book. How do you write a book? Massive ADD. <clears throat> Massive. The poster child. I mean, the worst. I still can't read. When my kids talk to me, I have to say, what are you saying? Or if I have to read directions, I have to get Shane or Max to read it and go, what are they saying? I can't even read little directions on how to put something on a phone, a, a, a screensaver. I can't, I can't make it out. And it's kind of frustrating that my mind doesn't work right. And then how do you write a theological book? Because I believe I didn't write it. That's what I believe. Just like the Bible wasn't written by men. This book wasn't written by a man. So the only reason I, 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 it was supposed to be ready in June. The only reason I, I'm presenting it to you, believe me, I'm, I'm never gonna present it again because I, I don't really wanna sell it. I'm gonna let the publisher do that because I'm in contract, okay? Um, the only reason I, I asked him if he could have some copies here is because he did send some. He made a deal, the publisher, with the people at this conference, and he's sending books. And I just didn't think it was right that they get the books before you do. Maybe you, maybe you could care less, but it doesn't matter. This is what I care about. This is my immediate family. That's my extended family. You follow? And I just didn't think it's right, no more than I think it's right to give fresh bread to your kids and give my kids crumbs. It's just not right. And it's biblical. So we got the book. You can get it on Amazon. I think it's going to be out in like two days. I believe it's, it's with, with, I don't have control over the price. I can't set it. I'm in contract with distributors. It's not a, a self-published thing. So I don't have control. So I had to go with what they tell me. But on Amazon, it's, I think, like 22 bucks with the, with the shipping and handling and the tax. Here it's 20. By all means, do whatever you want to do. Um, People wonder what shipping and handling is. There's a warehouse. They're not for free. People handle it, and they package it, and then the post office doesn't deliver it for free either. So it's not some made-up thing. So it's, it's, it's 20 bucks, and that includes the tax. They'll, I'll let the publisher deal with that and figure out how that works, and they'll just send me a statement. But anyway, I think it's going to be um, a good work, a good theological work. There's like 333 verses of Scripture. So... I, I feel, I, I feel uh, if, if you want me to sign it, uh, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll sit back and I'll do that. I have no problem with that, you know. And maybe, maybe if I drop dead, it'll be worth a buck more. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I understand that some people like that and it's sweet, you know. The first, one of the trips I went on when I went to a place called Chepe's in South America, this was an unbelievable place. I saw 12, 11 and 12-year-old girls selling their bodies for a buck. Um, and we were trying, me and my friend was trying to build an orphanage there. And um, the first time I preached there in a Pentecostal church, I finished preaching at about 10 o'clock at night. I stayed there till about 3 or 4 in the morning with a line of all the people, one by one, one by one, asked me to sign their Bible. Guys that had one tie to their name, giving me their tie to representative, now we're connected. People, if they had a, 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 just a quarter, giving it to me. And I said to my friend, I said, tell them to stop. And I'm just weeping. And we, he goes, you can't. You'll kill him if you tell him to stop. It's just the way they do it. So, yeah, I was signing their Bibles. It meant a lot to them. So understand, I'm more than happy to do that. I'd be glad to, okay? But please don't think that that's something I need to. <laughs> no, that's just not about it at all. So, um... Therein lies the story of the tabernacle. There's an approach to God. And this is the way you have to approach him once you're born again. Humility, contrition, submission, 
thirsting righteousness, being merciful, being a peacemaker, not a peacetaker, being pure in heart, and yes, being willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Let's stand together. Out there there is food out there uh, just a reminder the Bible says that gluttony is a sin um, <laughs> now we just you know Bernadette was here with four ladies Bernadette's been working on this she just felt like uh, she wanted to do something special for me I think and so we figured if you're gonna hang around you know you can get a because you're hungry at this point you sh it's you should be and then uh, four ladies joined her yesterday to help out um, a couple took off from work just to help out so Sometimes you have no idea how much effort and work goes into some of these things, but I, I thank her and I thank, I thank them uh, very much. You know who you are. I just don't want to say your names because you probably don't need that, but um, you know who you are. Thank you so much. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. The Yishmarecha, your Adonai Ponove Lecha, the Hunecha, Yisa Adonai Ponove Lecha, the Asem Lecha, Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, guys, I love you.